Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Heather Hirsch. If you're new here, I put out videos every week on all things related to menopause, perimenopause, and hormone therapy. I took a couple weeks off to enjoy some summertime and now I'm back. This video is really important to me because we're going to talk about the Women's Health Initiative and why we still have feelings embedded from the release of this study. Now, if you don't know much about the Women's Health Initiative, well, that's why you're gonna watch this video and learn a lot about it. The results of this study, what we call the unadjudicated results, or just kind of like the beginning of all that data, came out in the summer of 2002 and more data trickled out in 2003. Well, we just celebrated the 20 year anniversary of the release of the WHI. Now the WHI caused a lot of the confusion and the misconceptions and the myths about hormone therapy that we are still wading through today 20 years later. So to be able to better understand why I talked to my patients so much about the safety, the efficacy, and the benefits of hormone therapy, we really have to go back in time and study the WHI and what it was all about and what that means today. In the 80s and 90s, it was really commonplace that most women shortly after going through menopause were offered estrogen to help alleviate their menopausal symptoms. And that's the typical hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness. But there's lots of menopausal symptoms that kind of also go unnoticed. Now, at the time, this was studied prospectively, which means people were given a treatment, which was the estrogen, and they were watched going forward. And at the time, women were doing really well. They were having less heart disease, they were living a little bit longer, and having really good bones and improvements in their quality of life. In 1992, the American College of Physicians advocated for the use of hormone therapy postmenopausally. Now, the gold standard of care has always been randomized controlled trials. And in the mid 90s into the late 90s, there wasn't a randomized controlled trial on hormone therapy. So the difference between a prospective study when you give someone something, whether it's a drug or a procedure or a device, in this case, it was hormone therapy and watching them go forward, is you're not comparing them to another arm called placebo. So the idea was, well, hormone therapy seems to be really good, so let's do a randomized controlled trial of hormone therapy to see that these benefits are really what we're seeing. And hence, the WHI was born. Now, clearly I was not around for the design of the women's health study, but the design of the women's health study is so important because we take so much of what was found and extrapolate that to other populations or other formulations of hormone therapy that we don't routinely use as much as we do in the 90s as we do today. So the design of the study was to use women of um, a postmenopausal age and give them a medication called Premarin if you didn't have a uterus and Prempro if you did have a uterus. Now what's really important is the age of women enrolled in the WHI. The average age of women enrolled in the WHI was 62 and a half. Now this is important because the average age of menopause is 51. Notice that in the prospective studies in the 80s and 90s, women were given hormone therapy shortly after menopause. And age 62 and a half is on average 12 years after the last menstrual period on average. So it's really important to know that the average age of women in the women's health study was in the early 60s. And in fact, the age range of women in the WHI was 51 to 79. Now, certainly we now know that the age at which you start hormone therapy is really important, but we did not, or hence scientists and doctors, did not know that yet. Now you might ask, why did they use and choose Premarin and Prempro orally as the formulations for hormone therapy? Well, that was really standard use back in the mid 1990s. Now, what is Premarin? Premarin comes from horse's urine. We call it conjugated equine estrogen. Whether you agree with that or not, it's 
definitely up for debate in a different conversation. And Prem Pro was Premarin or those conjugated equine estrogens plus medoxyprogesterone acetate or MPA. And if you have an intact uterus, you have to take a progesterone to match your estrogen. So women were in the Prem Pro arm without their uterus and Prem Pro if they did have their uterus. These formulations, this oral route of conjugated equine estrogens and MPA is really important because the other thing that we now know is that formulation is really important and route is really important. So already looking back, we could see in the design study, there weren't necessarily flaws because we didn't know they were flaws at the time, but they were design elements that really make a difference when we're talking about the safety and use of hormone therapy today. There's one other crazy thing about the WHI that's really important, and that is that if you had significant symptoms, you were excluded from the WHI. The WHI was not designed to look at the use of hormone therapy to prevent menopausal symptoms. No, the WHI was looking at the use of estrogen to prevent chronic diseases. So they were looking at the use of estrogen to prevent heart disease, bone loss, cancers, and other things. That's really important because the study design plays a big role in how you then interpret those results. So all of that, you got to keep in mind. So the study sort of started in the mid to late nineties and why the study closed early was because of an apparent increased risk of invasive breast cancer in the Prem Pro arm. By crossing the study safety threshold, the arm of Prem Pro, estrogen and progesterone, was immediately stopped. The women who were taking estrogen only or Premarin who didn't have a uterus were actually doing great and there was no safety data that was worrisome to the investigators, so that arm actually continued for two more years. So in the early 2000s, in 2002, the media reported that the Women's Health Study has been shut down because of breast cancer. And this really began the worry, the fear, the idea that estrogen is dangerous and harmful. If we talk anything about breast tissue, there certainly is a visceral and emotional response among women. Now, I want to break this data down because it's super important. At the time, the media said there was a 26% increased risk in invasive breast cancer, which sounds frightening. I want to break down what that really meant in what we call absolute risk. The absolute risk of invasive breast cancer was four women out of a thousand over five years who were on the oral Prempro. The other thing you need to take in mind, as we've already discussed, the average age of women was much older in, on average in the mid 60s, and they were on an oral prep conjugated equine estrogen MPA dosage for five years. Years. This also was the incidence, not the death rate. And that's really important because actually those women outlived the women who got breast cancer in the placebo group. That's for another story. In fact, I did a really great video on the real risk of breast cancer, which you should check out if this is always a part of the WHI that still kind of trips you up. The study was closed, the tabloids, the media, and the newspapers were going crazy, and women stopped their hormone therapy right away. Doctors were really confused, women were really confused, the media was really confused, but at the same time, it was a really good news story. The thing that no one really paid any attention to any longer was that the women who were taking estrogen alone were doing really, really well. They didn't have any increased risk of breast cancer. They were actually healthier and having really good outcomes. Now the study was closed two years later for reasons that are unbeknownst to many of us. So the study ended first in 2002 in the estrogen plus progesterone arm and then in 2004 in the estrogen alone arm. Now something really interesting happened in 2007, 2013 and in other years subsequently since the results of the WHI is someone decided to look at them by the age at which women were at their last menstrual period and their outcomes. So what we saw when we looked at post hoc analysis of this study is that if you started the hormone therapy within 10 years from your last period, actually you had reductions in cardiovascular disease, you had reductions in a bone loss, improvement of quality of life, 
significant reductions in symptoms. You tend to, to live longer, have less diabetes, gain less weight, and a lot of really good outcomes. And this was all on Premarin or Prempro. As I also mentioned, the risk of breast cancer, while still seemingly scary to a lot of people, was actually statistically significantly reduced in the women who took the Premarin alone or the estrogen only after they had a hysterectomy. Even though all of this data was being collected between like 2007, 2015, 17, the use of hormone therapy just dropped precipitously. The idea, the ingrained idea that estrogen is harmful continued to stick in people's minds. You might say, but what about the risk of heart disease or stroke? Didn't that go up? Well, I just told you that when they looked at age of last period and how you did on hormone therapy, if you were within 10 years of menopause, you actually had improvement in those cardiovascular markers. Definitely check out this video here where I go in depth about you know, the timing hypothesis because that makes a big difference. The risk was actually slightly increased for cardiovascular disease and stroke if you were two decades, i.e. 20 years since your last period when you started on hormone therapy. Let's go back to breast cancer. Because the women who took estrogen only did really well, there were some people who actually wondered if it was the progesterone component. Studies using, using different formulations of progesterone, so not the MBA, but um, micronized natural progesterone or prometrium, norethindrone, or even a levonorgestrel, which is the progesterone in an IUD, actually found that they did not increase the risk of breast cancer, and that number became even lower. Now, just to put this all in perspective, four women out of a thousand over five years is also similar, if not lower than the risk associated with breast cancer. If you drink a glass of wine every day, if you are overweight, obese, if you have diabetes or hypertension. So we walk around assuming those risks all the time. It's just that the media made people feel in the early 2000s that hormone therapy gave you breast cancer. We actually don't think that that is very true. And I would definitely recommend you check out this video I did with Dr. Avram Blooming. We talk all about hormone therapy and it's real link to breast cancer. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, while the incidence was slightly increased, the mortality rate was not. What many experts actually think is that if you are prone or have a genetic risk or environmental risk for an estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive tumor, the hormone therapy may cause it to show up sooner and get treated faster. Because again, if you looked at the women in the estrogen progesterone arm in the WHI who got breast cancer compared to the women who were in the placebo who had breast cancer, these women actually outlived these women. So it's a very complicated, but what we know today from the WHI that makes us a lot more confident in prescribing hormone therapy is this. The reason that the prospective studies of women in the 80s and 90s looked better than the randomized controlled trials was because the women in the randomized controlled trial, the WHI, were on average 12 years older. And the majority of women were also much older. And only about 15% of women were even within five years of menopause. Whereas in the prospective studies, most women took hormone therapy shortly after menopause. So the age at which you start matters. The second is that formulation matters in different types of progestins and different types of estrogens, essentially bioidentical, but FDA approved hormone therapy tends to be the preferred option for many NAMS members. So this could be the estradiol patch, the estradiol tab, the estradiol gel. This could be micronized natural progesterone or combination tabs, something like uh, Activello, which is estradiol norethindrone, are slightly more preferred than Premarin and Prempro, although don't forget that a lot of the safety data that we have on the timing of hormone therapy and the reductions in breast cancer in the estrogen only arm do come from the WHI. So timing matters. Also the age at which you start matters. Your symptoms also probably matter as well as does the formulation of your hormone therapy and the risk of breast cancer really has been very much dissected to be a lot more acceptable to most women, if not having a null effect on breast tissue in general. All right, guys, I know that was a really, really lengthy, lengthy video with a lot of detail. It has taken me many, many years to be able to have this data stored away in a way that I can say it rapid fire. If you need to watch this video a couple of times, take notes, please do so. This is so important and fundamental 
to the conversation I have with patients on why to take hormone therapy despite the fears that you may have walked in the door. There's plenty of other trials that do go on to solidify this safety data as well. I hope you learned a ton from this video. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. Totally free to do so, and you can always change your mind later. I have tons of videos on hormone therapy, menopause, and perimenopause to help you make the best decision for you as you enter this super important transition. I'll see you guys next week for a brand new video, and thank you for watching.